1. When I was a teenager, I was home alone with my older sister, playing Sims 2 while she was in her bedroom. My mother was at my neighbor's house, which was only a short walk away. Two houses, really. When I heard the front door open, I thought little of it, to the point where I almost forgot someone had entered at all. That's the beauty of living in a small neighborhood in the middle of nowhere, I suppose. I saw something black in the corner of my eye, and as I looked over at the hallway expecting to see my mother, a woman with short blonde hair, a black down jacket, jeans and leather gloves walked in. I had never seen her in my life. She was looking around the place, at the pictures on the walls, our items, with a look that reeked superiority and a coldness I had never seen before. Can I help you? I almost stuttered, slowly getting up from the computer desk. I was so sure it was my mother as nobody knocked, nor rang the doorbell prior to entering. For the sake of privacy, I'll call the person she asks for R. Where is he? You're hiding him, aren't you? While asking, or rather demanding an answer, she started to move items around, opening drawers, like she expected to find someone there, moving lamps, looking through books. I don't know who you're talking of, I, I stopped. As a hulking man, young adult perhaps, stepped in behind her with his arms crossed. She picked up the phone on the desk and slammed it into my chest and sneered, R, I know he's been giving you stuff, and I'm taking it all back. Call him. Her eyes were wide with rage, and her pupils were so small in comparison to her iris. Yet somehow her eyes were so wide they almost looked too small in comparison to the bloodshot white in her eyes. I squeaked out that I didn't know his number, but she pointed out that his number was written down on a list with other phone numbers, and forced me to try to call him. I was shaking, the phone rattling in my hands as I listened to the slow beeping. However, it never reached him, which seemed to infuriate the lady. She shouted that she was going to take our TV and a bunch of other things I can't remember anymore. I pleaded for her not to take our stuff and she suddenly took a hold of me and slammed me into the wall, the leather creaking in her tight grip, and the fists she was making. She was going to steal all our stuff and kill me to boot, I thought, as the voice of the man rang out. Mom, that's enough. That's not what we came here for. Her son tried to reason with her, but without touching her. Mom, I thought, and realized he might be a few years older than me, 17, 18, 19 perhaps. He seemed scared to intervene. However, she only let go of me, as we both heard my sister's voice in the hallway of the bedrooms. By then I only remember screaming something to her, and backing towards the balcony. My sister began arguing with them, and I started to go into full panic attack. I remember opening the door to the balcony, which was covered in snow, as I barefoot ran out into the cold and into the streets toward the neighbor my mother was at. I remember slipping on the ice, stumbling, but made my way there, where I incoherently told my mom and my neighbors what was happening. They ran out immediately, me tailing behind them with our dog, which looked just as scared as I was. By then the lady had walked out with her son, still acting superior and high off her horse. She ended up clocking our neighbor in the face, and I'm sure the neighbor delivered in kind. Then they ran off down the road where it seemed they had parked their car further away from our house. I was shivering from all the adrenaline and the cold that was creeping in through my PJs. Apparently I had woken up half the neighborhood due to screaming and crying, while running to my mother. In this situation, it felt like the only thing to do. I only remember that I needed to go and get her. But now that I'm older, I feel ashamed of it. It feels bad knowing that in situations where push comes to shove... I would rather sacrifice the ones I love than standing up and fighting. Apparently she was high on meth or heroin and was angry at R for something. She wanted to meet us afterwards to apologize, but I never want to see her again, ever. In hindsight, it might not sound like a scary situation, but it's something that to this day plagues me. Due to this situation and another one I'd rather not go into detail about, seeing someone wear leather gloves makes me nervous and uneasy. I'm always scared of break-ins, 
and not having my doors locked at night. It has also made me more aware of people in general. 2. I'm a female in her early 20s, working in a rather popular pizza chain in my city. We are located in the middle of the upper middle class residential area, surrounded by churches and schools. I add this detail because it gives you an idea of the types of customers we usually get, which are a bit uppity. On to the story. It was a cold grey day in December, and the store was devoid of customers, just how I like it. I was working with three other co-workers that day, two were female. Let's say their names are Ness and L, who is basically our supervisor. The male on duty that day was our bartender, Brendan. As is the norm on slow days, we've all finished our prep work and are now awaiting the hordes of footholds to burst through the doors to make their demands. In walks a group of very gruff, out-of-place looking people. If you've seen Trailer Park Boys, then you'll be able to paint a picture in your mind of what these people looked like. The male leading the group was probably in his late 50s with a long grey beard that reached his beer belly. We'll call him the Wizard. The women, both in their 30s, had squeezed themselves into spaghetti strapped tanks that were far too small and sweatpants that were clinging desperately for dear life to stay on. They will be referred to as Tweedledee and Tweedledum. With them was a girl who couldn't have been more than 14. They made their order and sat all the way in the back of the dining room. After about five minutes, the man came up and just stared at my co-worker Ness. She politely asked him, do you need anything, sir? The wizard responded with, If only I was 20 years younger. He said this in the creepiest voice imaginable, like a frog had chain-smoked for 50 years and drank so much Mountain Dew that it had left a permanent sugary film of phlegm in his throat. My co-worker, a little caught off guard, began to nervously laugh. The wizard continued, You have anyone giving you problems? Anyone you don't like? You send them to my place, I'll take care of them. You're so beautiful. He then made his way back to his table, positioned his chair in the aisle in full view of the kitchen and just stared at poor Ness. While this creepy staring contest went on, I noticed Tweedledee and Tweedledum both used our restroom and taken a concerning amount of time doing so. But being more worried about this sinister wizard, trying to cast some sort of pervy spell on my friend, I ignored it. As we cooked their pizza, he would intermittently leave his chair and catch one of us to tell us how pretty Ness was and how he'd do anything for her. We were all thoroughly creeped out by this anti-Gandalf, and just wanted him gone. But the worst was yet to come, the wizard apparently carried lightning in his pocket. To be clear, he literally pulled out a small taser and began to tase the females with him, including the girl. We were so shocked, we just froze and watched. They didn't really seem to mind. They screamed and laughed it off like it was some sort of twisted game. Weirdest shit I have seen at this job by far. Being reasonable employees, we of course knew we must do something to stop the wizard from wreaking havoc in our humble restaurant. Having never dealt with a situation remotely like this, we didn't know what to do. So Al calls our store manager. He just says to give a warning and if the wizard refuses to cease his attack, we would have to call the cops. The wizard is told to sheath his weapon or he'll have to leave. He complies but resumes the stare down. Of course, he begins again with the taser ten minutes later, this time waving it in our bartender Brandon's face. Elle had at this point lost her patience. She confronts him, threatening to call the cops. Visibly angry, he gathers his brood and they leave, leaving behind a heaping pile of trash all over the table and floor. Animals. Remember how Tweedledee and Tweedledum were taking so long using the facilities? while they had shit all over the toilet. Like the toilet bowl and seat were covered in spatters of watery shit. On the floor around the toilet were droplets and small pools of piss. What the actual fuck? 3. So this happened to me earlier today. I've just moved into a more populated city in Victoria called Frankston, and I've decided to head out and look for the local job office. I get about halfway to the CBD. I live about a 5 kilometer walk away and I nearly shart. Luckily, I did not. I'm like, God damn it, man, really? 
I'm too far away from my new living space to turn around and try to make it back in time, and I have seven new housemates. So I did not want to walk in smelling like shit if I can't, especially since my room is the last one in the hallway, and I'm also a fair way out from the CBD. So I decided to forge on with cheeks clenched and search for one of the public restrooms. I found one, but it was only urinals. Why? So after a few near accidents, I find the public restrooms around the corner from the Dan Murphy. Again, warning post. I'm reluctant to enter because I've been in these before a few months ago, and the way the building is set up, it's super easy to get cornered. Rather than trying to get another 300 meters and going to the local shopping center, I decide to take the risk. I got lucky. So I carefully and quietly walk into the hallway that splits in two, and leads to either the men's or ladies, both of the stalls in the men's room, have been kicked in, and the stall I entered barely stayed closed, but I wasn't going to give up now. As soon as I sat down, instant relief. That is until I heard the scraggly voice of a woman that sounded like she'd been smoking for the better part of 40 years, and then decided to eat the butts and wash it down with pure ethanol. She heard me shart. She starts arguing with some guy that was in the ladies' room with her that sounded much, much younger than she was, about whether or not they should come out and see who had the tenacity to wander into a public restroom and actually use it. I actually think I woke them up. I decided to stay as quiet as possible while they continued to bicker about this and that. I wasn't really paying attention because I was trying to remain silent, while still sharting away as quietly as I could. Eventually they calm down and the woman puts on a baby voice and starts talking to someone in a manner that you'd expect when they're speaking with a dog or a small child. I didn't hear a response or any indication that there was anyone else with them, so I continued to stay silent. At this point I started to smell something. It wasn't weed. It smelled similar but had a sweeter aroma to it, with a bit of a burning plastic smell. That went on for a few minutes, and then they started discussing leaving, so again... I stayed silent and listened. That was a poorly attempted ambush to try and flush anyone out, as I soon discovered. When I was done, I stood up and had to debate with myself as to whether or not I wanted to flush the freshly painted toilet, which would definitely get their attention, or leave it for the poor bastard that would inevitably come and clean it. I flushed it, and in hindsight, I should probably have left it for two reasons. The first being that anyone else entering that facility that saw that, that wasn't turned off by the broken locks, likely would have gone to the shopping center. The second is that as soon as I flushed it, I heard the woman screaming at the guy. I told you go and check if there was someone else in here. You fucking shit-eating cunt. And footsteps. I very quickly left while maintaining a steady controlled pace, and I'm not going back. Though this is a PSA, do not use the public toilets in Frankston next to Dan Murphy. I could have gotten myself stabbed. 4. In 2012, I lived in the northern part of Dallas, Texas, and drove my husband's standard transmission 2002 Dodge Ram. 2500 4x4 diesel truck. It's a large truck, slow to stop at high speeds. It's relevant. Also, at the time, I was about four months pregnant with my daughter. I was driving to work and was going the speed limit of about 55 miles per hour, and was heading west on the frontage road of President George Bush Tollway in Plano. I was in the right lane and was approaching the intersection of Independence and Waterview Parkway, and the light had just turned yellow. I had plenty of time to make it through the intersection without changing my speed, so I didn't slow down. I was the only vehicle traveling in the westerly direction at the time and I saw an airport shuttle van waiting to turn onto the frontage road from the right, Independence. I noticed the van kind of hesitating on whether or not he was going to go, so I paid attention to it and mentally prepared for what he would do. As I came through the intersection, the van shot out in front of me, slowed down and was riding and swerving between my lane and the center lane, as if trying to determine which lane I would take to avoid an accident. Knowing that I would not be able to safely change lanes at that speed, I slammed one foot down on the clutch and the other on the brake and kept the wheel straight and hoped for the best. When the van saw that I wasn't going to change lanes, he got full in front of me and slammed on his brakes and came to a complete stop. I managed to stop my truck a little less than a foot away from the van's bumper. When I didn't hit him, he floored it. 
and shot across all lanes toward the next ramp. Once I had gathered my bearings, I also sped up, still in the right lane. I came parallel to the van as he entered the tollway, and he looked over at me and flipped me the finger, like I was the one who had done something wrong. It all happened so fast and had so much adrenaline coursing through me, that I didn't get the license plate, or even mentally register the company of the airport shuttle to complain or call the police. It still makes me mad to this day that I didn't get those details to report the guy. There are people out there willing to cause accidents and harm other people to make fraudulent insurance claims. Be on your guard. Know your vehicle and its capabilities. Knowing that perhaps saved me and my unborn baby. 5. The following two experiences are both shelled by Norel F. Guardian Angels. This happened in May 2010 in Victoria, Australia. I was driving back home to the city from the country after my mum's 60th birthday. I had to leave at 2am to get to work for a 6am start. This was because I had just started a new job, so I felt I couldn't ask for the day off. I was feeling wide awake and up for the drive, with coffee and the music on. I have done this drive many times before, albeit mostly in daylight hours, as I frequently visit my hometown where my mum lives but the following occurrence has only happened to me once. I was driving through an area that was affected by bushfires in the mid-1980s, on a particular section of Winding Road. As I rounded a sharp bend, I heard my name being whispered and saw a faint shadow of a woman and child behind the road barriers. This happened in a split second. It startled me, but I wasn't scared. I drove on and kept thinking about what had happened. I felt calm and alert, and decided that the woman and child were there to caution me and keep me safe. Mysterious Girl This happened one night while I was driving my partner to work. It was around 10.30pm, he is a baker. As we drove down a residential street in the suburbs of Melbourne, Australia, we saw a girl in the driveway of a house. She was wearing an old-fashioned white nightgown, and she had long black hair. She looked to be about 12 years old due to her size, but we couldn't see her face as she had her head down, looking at the ground. Alarmed, I said, oh my gosh, there's a girl. She looks too young to be out this late. My partner said, maybe she is sleepwalking. I agreed. But when I looked in the rear view mirror, I couldn't see her. I just thought I wasn't looking in the right spot or that the trees were now obscuring my view. My partner, who had been turned around trying to get sight of her again and make sense of what we saw, said he could not see her anymore either. We began discussing how strange it was. I said if she was sleepwalking, how does she get outside? Wouldn't her parents keep the doors locked? My partner said yeah, and now that I think about it, I haven't seen anyone with a nighty like that. The more we talked about it, the more we were confused about what we saw. On the way home after dropping my partner off at work, I went down that same street. As I looked for the house, I felt a bit creeped out, but I did not see the girl. We often recall that night whenever we drive down that street, but we have never seen the mysterious girl again. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Scary Subscriber Stories, Episode 69. And thank you very much to everybody who sent stories in for use in this video. If you have a story yourself, then please do send it over to kingofthecities at gmail.com. You can find my contact email in the description of every video. And various contact info also pops up on the screen at the end of every video while I'm doing these outros. Which you won't know if you're not looking at the screen right now. But trust me, it's there. I'd just like to say, I think the person in story one was much, much too hard on themselves. I, don't get, I didn't get the impression that they were sacrificing or abandoning their their family to save themselves or anything like that. They were in a, a difficult, dangerous situation they couldn't control, and they did the sensible thing, especially when they were young, by finding a responsible adult, finding someone they could trust, i.e. going to the neighbor's house to find their mum. And it was only like two houses down anyway. And that really, in a situation, if you don't think you can handle it, that's the most sensible thing you do. Get someone who can handle it. And well, that's just my two cents. Well, it's really more like a couple of bucks, to be honest with you. I hold my own opinion in high regard. Okay, and with that, I think I'll head off for now. So until next time...
Thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.